Greenwald, uh, thanks so much for coming and and for uh, participating in this uh, online broadcast by the History Consortium. I'm, I'm the chair of the History Consortium, and please keep in mind that we'll have presentations uh, for the next several days through Friday evening this week, so please join us. I do want to remind everyone that though we are at 7 o'clock in the evening for most of the presentations on Thursday evening, because of the length of the presentations, We'll start a half hour earlier at 6.30. So I hope you'll be able to join us uh, every one of uh, these five evenings. Well, with that, we will turn it over to Emily Amt and her presentation this evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the night, tonight's Macaulay Lecture. Tonight is a special lecture as we are live streaming this presentation with the History Consortium as well. The History Consortium is an association of historical societies, libraries, and museums in the central, South Central Pennsylvania and Northern Maryland area. Having said all that, I'm proud to, to present tonight's speaker, Ms. Emily Amp. Do oh, I'm so doctor. <laughs> Can't forget that. You worked really hard for it, didn't you? Yeah, it's not this. <laughs> I have a funny story to tell you after this. Anyway, back to the presentation. <laughs> Emily was a professor of history at Hood College, having earned her doctorate <clears throat> at Oxford University. A medieval historian by training, she has also published books and articles on medieval religious women and English, government, war, and finance. Her books include college textbooks and scholarly editions of Latin texts. Around 2010, she grew increasingly interested in Black history as she researched the enslaved people who have attended her church. Since then, Emily's historical research has focused on African Americans in Western Maryland in the era of slavery. Emily is now an award-winning writer on, her, on the African American history of Western Maryland. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Emily, Dr. Emily as she shares with us the exciting history of Black men in the Union Army at Antietam. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. And don't, please don't call me Dr. Dr. Emily or Dr. Emily. And Emily to all of you. Uh, and thank you for welcoming me here. Thank you, especially to Caitlin, who has worked for, uh, gone, gone above and beyond to organize this and to get me here, literally. And um, it's always a pleasure to speak here at the library, especially in the Macaulay Lecture Series. Uh, and thank you also to those members of the History Consortium who are attending um, remotely tonight and to the um, library audience that's attending remotely. I want to start with a word about the illustrations that I'll be using tonight. Um, none of the black men that I'll be speaking about um, tonight is uh, identified, oh, none of them are identifiable in these pictures, virtually none of them. And I haven't found pictures of any of the specific individuals that I'll be talking about by name tonight. But we have a lot of illustrations of uh, the black men in the Union armies. And so I'm using them to illustrate the general points I'll be making. And I'll also be using these anonymous portraits uh, to stand in for the specific men that I'll be talking about. Uh, in, uh, in two cases, I have pictures that are actually of the men I'm talking, the specific named men I'm talking about, and I will flag those for you when we get to them. So, to begin. So, as most of you in this room know, the Battle of Antietam was fought on September 17, 1862. It was an extremely important battle in the history of the Civil War, in the history of this nation. It was the single bloodiest day on American soil. It was a tremendously destructive battle, but it was also a battle that um, was important for Black history in a, a sort of complex way. It um, gave Abraham Lincoln enough of a victory or a non-defeat that um, he felt strong enough, they've been waiting for such a victory, he felt strong enough politically to issue the Emancipation Proclamation 
uh, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation a few days after the battle. And that said that he would free the slaves in the rebellious territories if the South did not surrender. The South did not surrender, as you all know. And so on January 1st, 1863, just a few months later, he issued the full Emancipation Proclamation, which freed, you know, technically, legally, the slaves, the people enslaved in the Confederate states. It did nothing to free people enslaved in Maryland or on the battlefield where Antietam was fought here in Washington County. It did, however, provide for the first time for black men, African Americans, to enlist in the US military, the Army and the Navy. And thus, the United States colored troops were founded. And that enlistment began in 1863 after the Battle of Antietam, obviously. So at Antietam, when it was fought, there were no black troops in the Union Army. There were no black troops in the Confederate Army either. And so people tend to not, historians tend not to really think much about black men as um, being in the Army at Antietam. And um, yet, the Army at Antietam did include black men, included hundreds, probably thousands of black men. Uh, they were there in a non-combatant capacity. And those are the men that I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, the Federal Army, from the beginning of the war, OK, now we can begin. I got it. Sorry. Ah. So well. So now. Okay, thank you. Let's see if I can make it. Yeah, I can make it quick now. Thank you. I just got tired of not clicking. So um, the Federal Army employed these men in all the non combatant roles that keep an army going. Uh, these three men of color worked as teamsters, as you see here, uh, loading and driving wagons, especially wagons pulled by mules. Um, they cared for horses. Um, this is an early Matthew Brady photograph from 1862. I zoomed in on the right there. They took care of the horses. They took care of other livestock. Uh, for instance, when the army took cattle with it on the hoof to eat. They shooed horses. Now, I'm going to say a few words about this photograph. I'm just going to interrupt my little spiel here to digress into this photograph here. This photograph was taken at Antietam. Some of you will recognize it. It's an Alexander Gardner photograph. Gardner was the photographer who took all the famous post-Antietam photographs on the battlefield. And this photograph, when we zoom in at this blacksmith camp on Antietam battlefield after the battle, we see a number of black men. Um, some of them clearly are blacksmiths wearing the long aprons, using the tools. And some of them may be blacksmiths or may just may be horse handlers, ostlers. Uh, but they are clearly um, prominent <coughs> and important in this blacksmith camp. Black men also did heavy labor, felling trees, digging ditches, repairing roads, building fortifications, constructing bridges. They worked also in the camp as cooks. They were very prominent as cooks. This is a drawing by an artist. You'll see a lot of his work tonight, Edwin Forbes. And here he has a, a camp kitchen out in the open air with a cook um, sitting at a table. Uh, they worked as personal servants. And I'll be talking quite a bit about some of the um, men who worked as servants for officers and, and soldiers. Uh, here you see a view by Forbes of uh, black men shaving a white officer, or maybe a white soldier, I should say. They worked as orderlies and ambulance men, and they worked as musicians. Here, um, this is a New York unit, and they are, the soldiers are pictured with two black musicians, one with a drum and one with a fiddle. Now, I should just as a side note say that the Confederate Army 
had black men serving in all of these capacities too. I, this is a talk tonight about the Union Army, um, but the, there were black men in all of these jobs in the Confederate Army as well. But the, men, the difference was, of course, that the men in the Confederate Army were enslaved. The men in the Union Army were virtually all free. I'll come back to that point about virtually all free in a few minutes. So um, before we come to Antietam, I want to talk a little bit about how men, how these black non-combatant men joined the army, how they got into these jobs in the army. And we don't have a lot of detail about the northern free men who came into the army, quite, you know, how they got these jobs. It's a little bit unclear. It's not something that was documented. But quite a few of them, you know, from the very beginning of the war, the army came into the war with these men in these jobs. These were free black men from the north. And one example locally is a man named Charles Moses Barnum. He used the two first names, Charles and Moses. He was from Washington County. He was from the Bakersville area. He was the 19-year-old son of a free black farmer named Thomas Barnum, whose farm was in the Bakersville area. Uh, unfortunately, it is not recorded on this map, although by a few decades after the war, Thomas Barnum was considered the wealthiest or one of the wealthiest black men in Washington County. And his son, Charles, or Moses, decided to be in the war. He could have stayed in relative safety on his father's farm, a large farm, uh, and then just uh, perhaps tangled a bit with the army when it came uh, through at the time of Antietam. But he decided instead to find work for himself in the Union Army. And a later account, in fact, his obituary, many years later, talks about this. It says, quote, early in the war, he crossed the Potomac River. You see, the Potomac is right here, not far at all from his farm. He crossed the Potomac River with the Union troops and became a waiter to Captain Fox of the 1st West Virginia Regiment. He continued with the army until the close of the war, end quote. And the details here are, you know, they're very, it's very detailed, it's very circumstantial. The problem is I haven't been able to locate a Captain Fox in the 1st West Virginia Regiment, so it seems like there's been some muddying um, with, the, with the length of time since this happened, and the obituary writer doesn't get all the de details quite right. But I believe that Charles or Moses Barnum did serve uh, with some Union troops in the war. And he served as a waiter, which means a servant who waits at table and does a whole lot of other things too, probably. We have a lot of photographic evidence of men who seem to be what you could call waiters or probably cooks and personal servants, like this man here. Uh, there's others too. Um, actually, this is not the best. Uh, I've moved the slide that had the best picture of that. Sorry. You'll see it later. Uh, but we see this kind of uh, employee, black employee, with army units and photographs all the time, Union Army units. Um, this is a photograph of General Caldwell's staff at Antietam. They are on the battleground for this photograph. And you see you know, the, the brass, and then you see um, the black servant also in the photograph with them. And I just threw this picture in, um, a similar kind of photograph, a New York regiment or some members of the New York Regiment posing with their black servant or employee to remind us that the drummer boys, the white drummer boys, were not the only children in the army. There were black children as well um, in these serving capacities as cook's assistants, maybe cooks, maybe waiters or just personal servants. This one seems to be associated with cooking and food since he is posing with a frying pan. Um, another way that men came into the army, and I think this was rare, was as slaves. Um, there were slave states in the Union, and there were enslaved men who were 
moved into serving capacities in the Army. We don't have a lot of information about that, but there's a case that's pretty well known locally. I first came across it, I believe, on Wilbur, thanks to Jill Craig, and it is, um, it may have been the Crossroads of Work uh, site now that I think about it, but one of the local sites that brings together interesting clippings from newspapers, and this one is a clipping from the Herald of Freedom and Torchlight in 1861, which tells us about Daniel Fox of Hagerstown. He was 18 years old when the war broke out, and in June of that year, his enslaver, Andrew Hager, quote, equipped him and then, quote, made a present of his services to Colonel W.H. Irwin of the 7th Pennsylvania Regiment for an indefinite period or as long as the war may last, end quote. Now, Fox, Daniel Fox, may, uh, presumably traveled with Irwin on his campaigns, and those were mainly in Virginia. And he may have been Irwin's personal servant, but there is some evidence to suggest elsewhere, evidence, that he may have been a blacksmith as well. And that would make sense of the word equipping up here. To equip a blacksmith is a little bit more of a deal than equipping a personal servant. And if he was a blacksmith, that would have made him more valuable to Irwin's whole company or whole regiment. And so um, it's possible he worked um, as a blacksmith more for a large, you know, for not just for Irwin, but for more men, more, more horses. Irwin later commanded the 49th Pennsylvania Infantry, which fought at South Mountain and Antietam. And of course, we don't know for sure that Daniel Fox was still with him, but it's a very good chance he was, and that Daniel Fox was present at the Battle of Antietam, serving as either a servant or as a blacksmith. Um, there are some, some pieces of evidence that make me think, and this is just a theory, that Daniel Fox later, under another name, enlisted in the United States Colored Troops. And I think it's quite likely that men who were working as non-combatants sometimes moved into the USCT, the United States Colored Troops, later in the war. They had military experience. They were used to being in the army and working with soldiers. And you know, they were used to military discipline to some extent. And so they would have made valuable uh, soldiers. A third way that people, uh, that men came into the army was as refugees, the so-called contrabands. These were the people who were fleeing Southern slavery, coming across into Union Army lines to flee from slavery and get protection. They were early in the war labeled contraband of war or just the contrabands. And many of the men in these groups of refugees went to work for the Union Army. Um, there is a famous the picture, a wonderful picture, of a group of, a small group of these contrabands almost certain, well, they were with the um, 13th Massachusetts. This picture was almost certainly taken at Williamsport in the winter of 1861-2. And um, when we zoom in on it, we can see a little bit more of these people, men, women, and some boys. Were any of these people paid? Excuse me? Were any of them paid? Any type of oh, yes. Absolutely they were paid. Well, all right. Do I have proof that they were paid? They should have been paid. They were, um, and I have some indications that at least some of them were paid, but these were jobs in the army. So they would have at least been supported and they were paid. And if they didn't want to stay, they could leave. Um, they were not enlisted under military discipline the way soldiers were. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on, okay? When we get to George. Hmm? There's no, there's no, no, so I don't know whether there are surviving army records of the pay of non-combatants, because not really a military historian. Um, there may be something like that somewhere, but, um, but there's almost no records that I've been able to find about these men themselves. 
But, but there are some indications of pay, and I'll come to that. And when we get to George Slow, I'll talk about the pay, okay? Um, but yes, there, there was pay for them. It would have been low. And yeah, it's, it's But they had very little, um, there was little to tempt them in the contraband camp. And a lot of the pay, I think, would have come from the soldiers themselves. The soldiers would have paid them. I see, okay, so I see people who probably know more about this life of the soldiers nodding here. Um, and that's the impression I get from the George Soul. And then the women, to digress into women for a moment, um, the women often work doing laundry and other kinds of jobs for the soldiers, and they would have been paid by the soldiers, not by the army, it, I believe. That was certainly the case in the Middle Ages, say, falling back on my other mm -hmm. training. Okay, so um, I want to just mention that at Harbors Ferry, which is of course close to us, there was a large contraband camp. And we know that as early as April 1862, the army required the, con the contraband men uh, there to work on a road project that included breaking stones. And then in June, um, some of the ex-slaves in the contraband camp there worked on a uh, project building a bridge and fortifications. So you know, these were hard labor jobs. They were very physical labor jobs that these um, former slaves were um, sort of requisitioned, in fact, informally requisitioned into uh, at one point. And then very similarly to the, the contrabands who had fled from slavery into Union lines, there was also recruiting in Virginia uh, when the Union Army went into Virginia, it often encountered men who were leaving slavery. And it would actively recruit these men into jobs in the Army. So here we have our first actual picture of one of the men whose stories I know. Get ready. This is the picture. Uh, this is a sketch by a soldier a Union soldier who tells this story about a man who was nicknamed Marvel by the soldiers. We don't have his real name, we just have this nickname, Marvel, and a little story about his recruitment. And I don't even know whether this is Marvel or this is Marvel. Obviously, these other four men are soldiers. Um, so Marvel, I'm going to call him Marvel because we don't have his real name. Marvel was enslaved on a farm somewhere between Warrington and Falmouth, in Virginia. And the 13th Massachusetts, which really gets around and has a lot of um, good, uh, left us, has left us a lot of good um, stories, letters and diaries and things um, in this area. The 13th Massachusetts was camped near Marvel's farm early in the summer of 1862. And then as the regiment was breaking camp and about to leave, this enslaved man, now we know him as Marvel, drove up with an ox cart. And again, the picture's not so great. You might think those are horses, but according to the tale, they are oxen. Um, and he was hoping to salvage anything good that the army might have left behind. The army often left stuff behind, and the local people, this is wartime, were looking for good stuff the army might have left. And the soldiers seeing him, thinking, yeah, possible recruit, not a recruit militarily, but a recruit to work for us, asked him, quote, ask him if he did not want his freedom, and if he did, to go with us, end quote. And the soldiers described him as highly delighted with the thought of being free, end quote. But Marvel said, he had some savings back at the house, and he needed to go back for the savings, which amounted to half a dollar, which for an enslaved man was something he just did not, could not see leaving behind. On the other hand, he knew that if he went back to the house, his enslaver, his master, might catch him and not let him go. But he decided to risk it. He went back to the house to get his half dollar. He got it did not get stopped. He came back to the soldiers and went away with them. Um, Marvel stayed with the 13th Massachusetts for what um, the soldier writing this diary said was a long time. The soldier said that Marvel was widely liked. And um, given the timing here, I 
conclude that Barbara was probably with the 13th Massachusetts at the Battle of Antietam, although I have no information about what the battle was like for him. Another man uh, who illustrates a final uh, way that so uh, these men could come into the army, who was also at Antietam, was Presley Dunwood. Presley was enslaved in the Confederate Army. He got captured. He was taken prisoner along with, I assume, along with Confederate men, um, and then you know, was happy to come over to the Union side and work with the Union Army. Um, he was taken prisoner by the 46th Pennsylvania Volunteers after what he described as a big fight near Winchester. This was probably in May of 1862. The only source we have for Dunwood's life of the army is this newspaper article in which he was interviewed and told his story. And it was printed decades after the Civil War in a number of newspapers around the country. And um, in it, he says, quote, from that time on, I was in the Union Army, however, <coughs> not as an enlisted man, so you know, as a non-combatant. I was in the battle at Cedar Mountain. So I put that up here. I was in the battle at Cedar Mountain, the second Bull Run fight, second Bull Run fight, and saw much of the battle of, of the fight at Antietam. Unfortunately, the newspaper says he, he's in the newspaper says nothing about his experiences at Antietam. And this was a something that I just ran into over and over again. I would be able to prove or you know show good evidence that someone was at Antietam, and then I would learn nothing about how they experienced the battle. Super frustrating. Um, but we will come back to Antietam experiences and get a little closer to you know, what it was actually like for them um, in a few minutes. I do want to say, before we do that, a little bit about the dangers of um, that these, these non-combatants encountered in the army. Three types of dangers. And the first one is this, the dangers that anyone in the army experienced and faced. And mainly, that's sickness, disease. As many of you will know, sickness killed more soldiers in the Civil War than battle did. So if you were a non-combatant, then clearly battle was not going to be a major danger for you, but sickness was. And uh, sickness, I think we can assume, although we have no statistics, at least none that I'm aware of, sickness killed large, killed large numbers of these non-combatant soldiers. Now, I don't, I was unable to find any um, first-hand accounts where these black non-combatants talked about their time in the army or wrote about their time in the army. But I'm going to use tonight a couple of excerpts from black soldiers who were from Hagerstown, because I think these illustrate the experience of these black men in the army as in a way that I hope you'll see as I read them. And the first one is from a deposition given by a man named Thomas E. J. Henry. Thomas, this Thomas Henry was the son of the Reverend Thomas Henry. Reverend Thomas Henry was associated with Ebenezer AME Church here in Hagerstown on Bethel Street. And the younger Thomas Henry was a member of Moxley's band, which you may have heard of. It was a, a musical band before the Civil War, composed of uh, both enslaved and free men. And in 1863, so after Antietam, it was uh, the men of the band were recruited together to form the first brigade band of the United States Colored Troops. They went to war together. And, um, and most of them came home together, too. But um, one of the men who died of disease in that band was James Howard. And in this little excerpt that I'm going to read you, Thomas Henry is talking about James Howard. And so I'm going to read this quote. James Howard was taken sick and sent to City Point, Virginia during the latter part of June 1864. No information having been received concerning him, I was sent to City Point to make inquiry. 
Upon arriving at City Point, I was told by James Gross, colored man, cook for the employees in the quartermaster's department, that Howard died about the middle of July in his Gross's tent, having come to visit him after being sufficiently recovered to go out of hospital. I visited the cemetery at City Point where he was buried and saw his grave." End quote. So here we have a little you know, mention of the cook, the black man who is the cook for the quartermaster's department down there at City Point. And we also get a picture of the, the community of these black men, both soldiers and non-combatants. Here's a black soldier in the hospital. He's let out of the hospital because he's recovered enough. And instead of going to a soldier's tent, he's taken in by the cook, who's you know, lower status than him as a cook in the army. And yet, the cook is the one who takes him in and shelters him. And he's obviously not better because he dies in the cook's tent. So the cook is the one you know, that he looks to for help. And when another soldier comes down, you know, what happened to our, our fellow band member? Where is he? It's the cook who's like, okay, let me tell you what happened. So you know, there's this you know, little vignette that just sort of opens a window, I think, on how the black men looked after each other in the army, whether they were soldiers or non-combatants. And also, of course, how sickness could claim them. Another uh, problem, another danger was work. Physical labor required of many of these non-combatants, but also of soldiers. The um, US colored troops notoriously were often used not for combat duties, but for labor, for physical labor. Uh, of course, um, some kinds of work were more dangerous than others. The ambulance men who went out on the battlefield were exposed directly to fire and possibility even of capture. Uh, three uh, black ambulance men were captured on the field by Confederates at Bull Run, second Bull Run. But injuries from physical labor were common. And so this is the second excerpt I want to read. This again is from a black soldier. This is from Robert Moxley, who was, is a well-known figure in local black history. He was the leader of Moxley's band, the musical band. And um, this is from an 1865 incident. So again, I'm going way post Antietam, but I think this gives us a good flavor of the kind of uh, labor and injury that these men um, were subject to, uh, which we rarely hear of from their, their own uh, mouths. And again, this is, a, this is a deposition. So it's been you know, manipulated a bit in language by the clerk, the legal clerk who was writing it down but you still get a flavor of his own language. Robert Moxley says, quote, we was to go out and cut timber and build quarters at the general headquarters for the use of the band. This was in front of Fort Harrison, Virginia. And as we was returning with the timber and crossing the swamp, we was compelled to step on fallen timbers, which was covered with snow and ice. James Hill did then and there slip and fall a stride of a small pine tree, it means you know, his legs were on either side of it. At the same time, having on his shoulder a cut of timber about 12 feet long and about six inches in diameter. So he's got this big long log on his shoulder. When he fell, I heard the noise. And when I came up to him, I found him in great pain. The fall disabled him and rendered him unfit for duty for about three months, end quote. Oops, I'm supposed to have a different, different slide. So that was the working slide, sorry. So here again, we see, you know, these men are doing this hard work and it's in a swamp in ice and snow and, you know, they're just sent out there to cut logs. And I think this is indicative of wartime conditions, but also the worst jobs were often given to the black. The third thing that um, I want to mention is the racial issues. Um, here, this was my waiters um, slide, men serving as waiters. Early in the war, black non-combatants 
were at risk simply for entering Maryland. Sometimes they were arrested under the state's laws that said free black, men, free black people cannot enter the state. They're not allowed. Sometimes local enslavers claimed to recognize men who were employed by the army as escaped slaves who belonged to them. And the army, with disturbing frequency, handed these men over to these people, to these enslavers who claimed to own them. There are a number of cases, three or four cases of this in Washington County alone, in, um, that are documented in the newspapers. So um, you know, this was something that probably they didn't expect when they signed up to work for an army unit uh, in the Civil War, but it happened, and it was very disturbing. OK, so those are some of the dangers these men faced, apart from bullets. I now have three personal stories I want to tell you. Uh, the first one is a little longer, and then the last two are quite brief. I'm going to drink the water. And the first is the story of George Sloan. These are all men who um, we will take to Antietam and see what happens to them there. So the first is a man named George Sloan. First Love was born into slavery near Winchester, Virginia. And in 1862, when the Union Army arrived in the area where he lived, he was 32 years old. He left the plantation where he had grown up, and he was traveling with several other enslaved men. And a group of Union, of Union soldiers encountered them near Charlestown. The captain approached them as they were resting against a fence. And the captain asked them, quote, whether they would like to join the army, quote, a little bit misleading. Um, and that's the, the quotes that I have here are from one of the soldiers, the soldier who, that, um, the officer that George Slow would eventually work for. These men said, yes, they would like to join the army. And that is how they were recruited into their non-combatant roles. Slow, George Slow, ended up working as a cook and personal servant for a Lieutenant Frank Donaldson of the 71st Pennsylvania Infantry. And Donaldson's letters are the source for Slow's wartime experiences. Donaldson, and this is not, this is not Slow, this is not the Pennsylvania um, Infantry, but you'll see how it applies in a moment. Um, I hope. So Donaldson describes Slow as, quote, a first-rate cook and very handy generally. And as I read the letters where he just keeps mentioning Slow and what he did today and this and that, it seemed to me that Slow was very good at using his experience in slavery, very smart, <coughs> very wise, really, and using his experience in slavery to make the officer, Donaldson, appreciate having him around. And Donaldson found that he enjoyed being waited on by a trainee servant. And I think this was the experience of many white officers when they encountered these, um, enslaved, these formerly enslaved men who had been trained as servants. That, oh, this was a level of, of you know, attention to their needs and wants that they had not previously been used to. Uh, in his letters, Donaldson describes Slow at the beginning of their relationship in really condescending and racialized terms. He says, so this is the most disturbing part of this section of this Slow story, so I, I warn you in advance. He said, Donaldson writes, he had been, he had been a house servant and nicely, this is the quote, well, he had been a house servant and nicely brought up. Indeed, for that matter, his conduct, conduct and manners soon bespoke him a quality dark. We like him very much. Our camp is full with con filled with contrabands, and everyone now has his George to pull off his boots and wait upon him. My George has proved a treasure, and by his conduct commands respect, not only from the soldiers, but from the Negroes also. The latter, however, he is too swell to notice." End quote. 
So it seems like George came from the, the um, upper echelons of the plantation hierarchy. Now, later in life, after the war, Donaldson wrote about Slow again, and um, he was, I think, wiser in his assessment of George Slow. And he remembered him as, quote, irreproachable in character, kindly, manly, brave, faithful, true, always to be depended on, unquote. And he also recognized George Slow's value, quote, not only for these sterling qualities, but for the tenderness with which he watched over me, a young soldier, end quote. So I think you know, their relationship deepened over time as they went through the war together. Slow's duties focused primarily on food and cooking. That was his main area of activity. He fetched provisions from nearby towns. He rustled up foodstuffs when they were scarce, scarce including chickens, bread, butter, and eggs. He cooked for, uh, for Donaldson. He cooked plain fare. He cooked more things that were more like delicacies. Some of the foods he cooked were coffee, omelets, buckwheat cakes, ash cakes, stewed beef with side dishes and relishes, eggnog, butter punch, and apple fritters. And these were all things that Donaldson mentioned in his letters, so there were obviously many other things as well. And then on one wonderful occasion, um, uh, Slow obtained a hog's head, a pig's head, and he stewed it to make jowl, a dish called jowl, which clearly was for himself and not for Donaldson. There was no indication that Donaldson was going to eat this. It was, you know, Donaldson was like, he made this thing for himself called jowl. So yeah, it was not for the Yankee officer. It was for the Virginia uh, black man. He had lots of other duties and activities, and that included those included carrying his officers' gear, or extra gear, setting up camp when they arrived at their camping place, building the fire, keeping the fire going, carrying messages all around the camp, catering for guests. And as Donaldson grew, you know, more experienced as an officer, he had to entertain, helping the officer manage sick and drunken soldiers, which helped, you know happened with some frequency, and cleaning up when parties got out of hand. And uh, uh, Slow was very good at, at many of these things. And I, this picture here shows um, black men in the army camp smoking bacon, but one of them is holding an ax, and there is a little vignette in, a um, little anecdote in one of Donaldson's letters where um, George Slow sharpens an ax and uses it. So he had he was a trained house servant, but he also knew how to deal with tools. Early in their time together, when they were just, you know, had not been together very long, Donaldson faced his first battle as a lieutenant. He was a newly promoted officer. And he called Slow to him, and he handed over his personal belongings, his watch and so on and his personal papers, and he told Slow what to do with them if he was killed, if Donaldson was killed. And this was very moving to Slow. He was starting to tear up. And that was became their ritual. Donaldson made it through the battle just fine. He made it through the war fine. They both did. Um, but this became their ritual before every battle that Donaldson would hand over his papers and his valuables to George Slow um, for safekeeping and to you know, then do what he needed to do if Donaldson didn't make it through the battle. And over time, they became much more comfortable with each other and Slow found the officer growing more dependent on him. And at one point, there's just one time when Donaldson actually quotes something that George Slow said. And that was when um, Donaldson was getting dressed and he took off, started to take off something to change it. And so I said, oh no, don't do that, Captain, for it's bad luck to change a garment after having made a mistake and putting it on. Yeah, don't change it, no, no, don't do that, bad luck. So you know, he, he you know, feels comfortable enough to start you know, sharing little superstitions and guidance with this officer. They were together for two years, and in that time, 
Uh, slow was sent on furlough three times. And so this is where, um, to address part of your question, or something I thought of because of your question, I think you know, they were, it was up to the officer to send um, a, a servant on furlough. If you look at military records, if a soldier wanted to go on furlough, oh my goodness, the paperwork is immense. It has to go all the way up the chain of command and all the way back down again. But for a, a servant, it really is, I think, just a matter of the officer saying, okay, well, George, you know, if you be back in two weeks, that'd be great. And off he goes. He went twice down to Virginia to visit this family on the plantation. That's one of the times he brought back the pig's head and made jowl. He brought a lot of food back from his mother and shared it with Donaldson. And then the third time, the third furlough was to Pennsylvania. And he visited Donaldson's family, the white officer's family. I found that quite extraordinary, but that's what apparently happened. So, August 1862, oh, the sounds. Uh, Donaldson was transferred to the 118th Pennsylvania Infantry as a captain, was promoted, and he took Slow with him. And a month later, the 118th was present in the reserves at Antietam. The wife Maryland now. Slow was still working for Donaldson. It was around this time that Slow got an officer, an offer from another officer for more money to come work for him. But Slow reported this to Donaldson and said, I can't imagine her, I just can't think of working for anybody but you. I just can't think of that. No. So uh, maybe he reported the higher offer in hopes of getting a raise, I don't know. Um, but um, they moved, the, the army moved into Maryland and about that time, as they, as they moved to Maryland, which I'm sure was a large, chaotic movement, they became separated. And Donaldson writes about the mentions, just mentions this in the letter. He says, hey, we got separated about the time we came into Maryland. I, I don't know where he is. Dude, I am trying to do some research here. Please keep track of him. Um, but there is no record of where George Slow was during the Battle of Antietam. <laughs> I'm very attached to George Slow by now, and I'm just, just like, oh, no. Uh, but they connected up again in October. So, you know, they both made it through, and um, they made it through the rest of the war together. And I will just say that after the war, Slow went north, um, just like Donaldson, and Donaldson found him a job in Philadelphia, and the two stayed in touch until George Slow's death as an old man. So. That is the story of George Slow, although obviously I misled you in saying I was going to talk about Antietam with him. But it's just such a, a magnificent uh, story, I think, uh, that it gives, sheds a lot of light on what uh, a man in his position, serving an officer, uh, how he lived in the Army. So another story is that of Bob. This is a short story. But I think you should bring a lot of that George Slow information to inform what we know about Bob. Bob worked for um, a doctor. He was a personal servant to Dr. Theodore Diamond, who was the surgeon of the 2nd Maryland Regiment. And uh, Bob provided general, again, not Bob, just a picture. Uh, Bob provided general support to the doctor in a role that included looking after the doctor's horse know that. And here again, the only source we have for Bob's experience in the Army, or really for Bob at all, because I don't even know his last name, is the white doctor's letters. Uh, the two of them arrived in Sharpsburg, in the Sharpsburg area, I should say, on Sunday, September 15th, and the doctor sent Bob, quote, to the farmhouses to get some food. But being black, he could get nothing. And I'm sure that what um, the doctor means here is that the locals were unwilling to sell food to an unknown black man. Even though they were very familiar with black people in the Sharpsburg area, there were 400 or so living all around, um, they just were, or they were out of food. But Sunday they still had food, so I think they just were not so willing. Or Bob wasn't making much of an effort, who knows. Um, after the battle began early on Wednesday morning, Bob and the other servants of the 2nd Maryland 
um, division of Sir Miller's regiment were still cooking breakfast as the battle began. And um, they were, according to the doctor, dodging and crouching at every shot. Breakfast that morning was simpler than usual in this camp, according to the doctor. It was just pork, hardtack, and hot coffee. And then the doctor had business to attend to, and so he instructed, he was going to go out onto the battlefield, so he instructed Bob to, quote, keep himself and the horse behind the haystacks till I sent for him. So I have a couple of views of haystacks at Antietam here. Um, there's a haystack. There's some haystacks after the battle. These are all after, sort of during and after the battle. They're not really showing you exactly what it would have been like for Bob, but you know, haystacks offered some cover, but not much protection. And Bob waited behind the haystacks with the horse from breakfast time until late afternoon. So very sort of dull, but also probably fraught um, time for Bob that day during the battle. And then in the late afternoon, Dr. Diamond came back to collect his horse and decided to ride, the doctor did, to Belinda Springs, which was a couple of miles away, Belinda Springs. Um, and he, quote, told Bob to follow on after. Thanks, doctor. So Bob got to walk to Belinda Springs while the doctor rode the horse. And when Bob got to Belinda Springs, he found that Diamond, the doctor, had gone on further on, a couple more miles, to set up a field hospital at a farm a little distance from Belinda Springs. So, you know, Bob basically spent some time playing catch up with the doctor. It seems to me that the doctor did not really rely on Bob for anything medical. Um, he was more of a support, general support person. Uh, there may have been other doctor servants who were more helpful in the medical uh, area. But Bob seems to have been mostly a horse carer and coffee maker. Um, not really sure. And, Bob, and the doctor doesn't say anything about Bob in any of his other letters. So that's what we've got about Bob. And the final um, story I want to tell you is that of Solomon Stratton, which I promise is more exciting, but very short. Um, so, um, Solomon Stratton grew up, this is right, I'm not showing the picture yet. Uh, he grew up enslaved at a place called Stratton Manor on the eastern shore of Virginia. He obviously, um, unlike most Western Marylanders, he uh, took his name from his enslavers. And then in 1860, at the age of 16, he escaped to Washington, D.C. Uh, so he's already showing um, some signs of being, there you go, yes. He's showing some signs of being someone who's um, got some get up and go. And in the fall of 1861, he went to work for uh, Second Lieutenant Carlos Henry Verbeck of the 8th Illinois Cavalry. And um, Solomon Stratton's job was to tend Verbeck's horses. They were present at the Battle of Antietam, and during the Battle of Antietam, uh, cavalry officers fared fairly well. They had horses to keep them out of the fray. Um, but Verbeck's horse, and, and I'm just trying to get represent here the chaos or the the, the yeah the, the turmoil of the battle, even for a cavalry officer. Verbeck's horse was killed under him. This is this story is an oral tradition handed down in Verbeck's family. So according to this oral tradition, Verbeck's horse was killed under him on the banks of Antietam Creek. And I don't know if that's literally by the creek or if it just means at Antietam, but that's what the story says. And um, then Stratton, his servant, came running onto the battlefield with a fresh horse, gave it to him. Verbeck was able to get onto the fresh horse and fight on. His life was saved, perhaps, but his, certainly his, his ability to fight was, um, was saved by Stratton's quick thinking and bold and daring action. After the war, Stratton, like George Slow, moved to the place where the officer he had served lived. In this case, 
Stratton moved to Verbeck's home county in Iowa. He purchased land there from Verbeck, so Verbeck sold him some land. Um, Stratton married and raised a family. This is Stratton right there. So this is the only, only photograph I have of one of these men um, who I wrote about and talked to you about tonight. And today, Stratton is remembered in Worth County, Iowa, as a hero of Antietam. And that is largely because of the oral tradition handed down by his officer, William Henry, sorry, Car Carlos Henry Verbeck. So that is where I'm going to stop with a face of a black hero of Antietam on the screen. The end. <laughs> happy to take questions or not sure. just a perspective that i've developed over the years looking at some more images i think a lot of people mistakenly think they're soldiers because they're wearing different pieces of uniforms and you saw that in the, in the sketching and also the, the images yes. right so um Many of these um, black non-combatants did wear pieces of uniform, and that was remarked on. And in fact, in um, very early, the early years of the war, there's an editorial or a, a piece of, of a news item, an item in the newspaper in Frederick complaining about this. Here, you know, Frederick in Western Maryland. And in fact, it notes that they often carry guns. It says they have you know, sidearms and. And this is just disgraceful. They shouldn't be wearing uniforms. They shouldn't have guns, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, they really um, presented themselves as soldiers as much as they could. And they often, often wore the, the caps, especially. And then other pieces of, of uniform, definitely. But, you know, it's clear that they're mixed in with the white soldiers and that they are servants. Um, and the same thing was, was you know, mentioned about the Confederate. Troops, even that the Confederate uh, enslaved men, you know, the army, the black men in the Confederate army, even that they wear discarded pieces of Union um, uniforms, which I'm sure Confederate soldiers themselves did too. Um, and in fact, Solomon Stratton, he's a very odd case. And, and it's one of the reasons I, I mentioned it's an oral tradition. I have found little to. Um, I think it's I think that he was there. There's no question he was there. But Solomon Stratton applied for a military pension. And he gives his unit as the unit that Verbeck commanded. And there's no indication that he got a pension, but he seems to have, you know, did he did he think he was a soldier? But he probably just thought he was eligible for the pension. I haven't found the application, but I found the card. You know those those index cards that show that there was an application. So, you know, it, and then I also found that um, Presley Dunwood attended, who, who was a servant in a white unit, he attended reunions of that white unit. And when you read the little um, newspaper article. Or, you know, items that list the veterans who attended. His name is just there among the veterans. So as if he's one of the veterans. There's no distinction of, you know, Presley Dunwood colored or Presley Dunwood servant. He's just listed among the veterans. And it made me start to wonder when I, you know, got like, when I'm researching like the black veterans organization here in Hagerstown, and I just assume if somebody's a member of the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the veterans organization here, I sort of assumed that means they were USCT. And I try to follow it up, but sometimes I can't find their USCT records. I wonder if some of them were non-combatants and they were just welcomed into the GAR. So it's made me kind of rethink this and it's gonna be you know, something to, to look into. Thank you for that good question. Yes. Yes. Um, it, it, it sounds like a uh, perfect case for reparations because of you know not being paid and uh, just like Stratton, uh, 
you know, they're, they're in a military van now uh, who work as books and what have you are paid. And, and, and this guy having to go on the battlefield and, and replace the, the horse, I mean, he was, he was in that bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he was undoubtedly paid. Well, I I think that he was certainly paid by Rebecca, who he worked for. Um, but did not get a pension. But not he didn't get the pension, right? right. And the pensions were available under you know, even if he had been eligible, even if non-combatants were eligible for pensions as a pensions as a general rule. There were very, you know, you had to jump through a lot of hoops to get attention. You had to show that you were, if you were the, the, um, the soldier yourself, you had to show that you had been injured in the war and that your current disability was a result of that injury. And so yeah, there was a lot of red tape. And it just breaks your heart sometimes to read these pension files. Um, so even if, but yes, I mean, your general point, yeah. There were a lot of men who served and served in danger and were not eligible for pension. I don't know. Yes. I haven't read your book, so okay. I apologize for not uh, knowing this already, but the different groups of black men who became involved in, in uh, the Army life, what what sort of medical care were they given? So this talk is based on one chapter of the book, which is about, or part of the chapter, the chapter about the men in the armies. And it got most of what I know. There is more in the chapter, but not a lot more. And that's a really good question, which I really was only thinking about as I put this talk together last this past week. Oh, I wonder if they went into the regular hospitals, or did they have to go to a contraband hospital, or like, you know, where would they have been taken care of? I, I just, it, I mean, it's a really good question. Where did the non-combatants in the army get their medical care? And there may be people in the audience who know, but I don't know. Well, one example that you gave was that a young man that got sick and went into the battle in the hospital and it he was a soldier. He was a soldier, and he, you know, so I think somebody made a mistake, but did they make the mistake partly because he was black? I don't know. Yeah, and people had, you know, the, the diseases they were dealing with, you know, they had relapses all the time, and of course the army was eager, probably sometimes said, well, you're, you're a fit soldier, get on your feet, you know, get back to your unit. And the soldier's like, I don't feel so well. I think I'll go see my friend, the cook. And, you know, they hadn't reported him to his, his actual unit at all. And I don't have, I, I don't look at enough military records or read enough about the military in the Civil War and have a sense of how often something like that happens. But when I do look at the military records, there's an awful lot of people who are, you know, absent since you know last year I'm not sure where he is so there's quite a lot of that in the military in people's individual military service records it was bad to people which was really your question well i will just mention that there's more of this more about some of this Men in the book in one chapter, and there's also material about the Confederate, the men, the black men in the Confederate army. But most of the book is most of the book is about civilians, and um, really about the 400 or so um, enslaved and free civilians who lived on the battlefield, um, in and around the battle, on and around the battlefield at Antietam, and how they experienced the Civil War and especially the Battle of Antietam. And I know that I sort of led you up to the battle and then like, I don't really know. But for the civilians, we know a great deal more about how they experienced the battle. And we have um, personal narratives of what they experienced and um, a great deal more specific information.
So um, the book is over there if you'd like to take a look at it or even buy it, but no pressure. And I'm happy to sign copies of you, but, but I'm also happy just to talk after the wrap this up. Okay, I'm getting the thumbs up from the producers. Thank you all very much for coming.